Hi. Um, I want to welcome everyone um, to this event, uh, uh, the Chicago Center for Contemporary Theory, um, the making of, of you know, global capitalism. Um, by, um, the, the great new book by Leo Panitch to my left and Sam Gendon to my father left. Um, I, it's my unanticipated honor um, to um, be able to introduce my two good friends and comrades and colleagues. Uh, um, you know, my name's Adolph Reed, by the way, not that anyone one would know or care. Um, and I'm just in town. I'm the roadie for the Panitch and Gendon show, actually. This is my second city. I hope I'll be in uh, you know, at least a third with them. Um, I'm, um, Leo Panitch is a professor of political science at uh, York University in uh, Toronto. Um, and he is, um, along with Sam and uh, Greg Albo, who is the one who is not here, uh, most re recently of um, a wonderful little book called In and Out of Crisis, which is the more of the political condensation, I would say, of the argument of this major accomplishment, which, again, I'm going to hold up and urge everyone to buy. Uh, the Making of Global Capitalism, the Political Economy of American Empire, Verso Books, 2012. Um, that is, um, I can say from my own judgment uh, that this is like the most serious and, and significant, um, it intellectually rigorous and uh, politically solid account of uh, the construction and uh, the evolution of um, American empire post-war. And among other things, uh, you know, I don't want to you know, start to kibitz in the talks, uh, but among its other um, important, really important arguments is um, um, a bucket of much needed cold water on the mythology that the American empire is in decline. Um, so um, I'm um, as I said, Leo is a professor of political science at York. He's the author, in addition to In and Out of Crisis, uh, The End of Parliamentary Socialism, uh, Renewing Socialism, and the book I just encountered a couple of days ago, actually, on the Labor Party in, in, uh, in uh, near the UK. Uh, Sam Gendon is um, also recently a professor at uh, York, but more importantly, was a longtime official of the Canadian Auto Workers Union and uh, the author of an important book on the birth of the CAW. Um, so with the introductions out of the way, now I'm going to get myself out of the way and turn, turn it over to Sam and Leo. And I think, pardon me, the format is that, um, that uh, you know, Leo's going to open for a bit and then Sam's going to talk and then you can have Adam. Thank you and welcome. Thank you very much, Adam. Once again. Well, I, I very much appreciate you coming out. I want to thank Anwin and Mosh and the uh, 3CT for setting this up and having me and Sam here. Um, uh, we're calling this talk uh, American Crisis, Global Crisis, which is actually the title of one of the chapters. Uh, so I'm going to, we're going to try to focus today on uh, what led to the current crisis and how an understanding of it provides a window and understanding both the process of capitalist globalization uh, over the last 50 years, really, and uh, the nature of the current crisis. Uh, we're five years now into uh, what has to be seen as the fourth great global crisis of capitalism. Uh, given its length and depth, given its global extent, uh, it, it compares now with the long but more sporadic crisis that went from 1873 to 96, uh, with the Great Depression, and with the crisis of the 1970s. Uh, it deserves, in our view, to be called the American crisis in the same sense that we call the crisis of 1997-98 the Asian crisis, uh, which began in Thailand, spread to Korea, but eventually, of course, uh, engulfed Russia, Brazil, and even Wall Street with long-term capital management meltdown, et cetera, became global. Uh, this one uh, deserves to be called the American crisis uh, because although it has spread, uh, even more quickly and even more widely and certainly more deeply, uh, it began here. And uh, that's very important. Uh, 
its global nature was well captured actually in November 2007. Most, a lot of people date the crisis, the, the depth and extent of the crisis from the collapse of Lehman's in September 2008. But it was The Onion, that remarkable satirical <laughs> newspaper, of which I'm happy to say there's a Toronto subsidiary. Um, the Onion had a headline in November 2007 which read, quote, Bush proud U.S. economic woes can still upset world markets. <laughs> um, yet is this a crisis of American hegemony? It's an American crisis that's led to a global crisis, but is it a crisis of American hegemony? Is it a crisis of this remarkable informal American empire? Uh, that has superintended the spread of capitalism over the last three neoliberal decades, but more than that, really, as we argue in the book, really since World War II. Uh, the nature of the American empire, which is what we're trying to come to grips with uh, in the book, is primarily, although it won't sound to people in the Middle East this way, uh, an empire by invitation. Uh, in which ruling classes around the world, but above all in countries like Canada, uh, Japan, uh, Western Europe, which become Canadianized uh, by the 1960s, uh, uh, the ruling classes and state elites of those societies invite American penetration and uh, become uh, uh, active elements in the American empire. Uh, but very much not through a process of military intervention or coercion, even if there is always, of course, uh, an element of that going on. Uh, but it was already the case uh, in the uh, 1960s and 1970s uh, that uh, people, uh, not least political scientists, started speaking of the decline of American hegemony. Indeed, uh, since we're in a presidential election campaign, uh, the crisis of the dollar that emerged during the Nixon-Kennedy campaign, when Kennedy had to pledge himself to maintain uh, the value of the dollar right after convertibility of uh, European currencies, there was this enormous flow of American foreign direct investment to Europe. Uh, and it coincided uh, with the beginnings of the vast exports from Japan and Germany to the United States. Uh, it upset the usual pattern of there had been a dollar glut in Europe and Japan through the 50s. Now there were too many dollars sloshing around. Uh, people were buying gold, uh, and the beginnings of what was known as the dollar crisis in the 60s began then, and people started predicting it then. As Bretton Woods came apart, and I will talk about you know, how that happened in a minute, uh, all the more did you hear uh, that the crisis of the dollar, the crisis of Bretton Woods, signaled the decline of the dollar and the decline of the American empire. Um, but as the great uh, Greek-French Marxist Nikos Poulantzas put it, in direct opposition to people like Ernest Mandel, who were speaking of the resurgence of inter-imperial rivalry, with Europe taking the lead in his view in, in that respect, the united Europe taking the lead in that respect. And as Poulantz has put it, there's no solution to the crisis by European bourgeoisies attacking American capital. The question for them is rather how to reorganize a the hegemony they still accept. Uh, Sam and I argue in the book that that's still very much the case today and very much the, the case in this crisis and not only applies to the European bourgeoisie, but we would argue even to the Chinese bourgeoisie, that communist elite that is now a Chinese bourgeoisie. Um, but let's take a step back in order to get at this. Uh, if you look at the crisis of the dollar in the 60s that led to the collapse of the fixed exchange rate in Bretton Woods, et cetera, where all the world's currencies were tied to the dollar and only the dollar was tied to gold. Um, that was responded to uh, with not with less but closer integration of the core states that composed the American <coughs> Empire. 
not only were American MNCs going from the United States to Europe and foreign direct investment, you know, having been what, in Europe, 15% of the global total was by the mid 60s, 30% of the global total. Uh, Latin America's receipt of foreign direct investment had gone down to 15%, a historic shift. Right? And it expressed the shifting nature of the American empire as it incorporated the other mature capital estates, the previous capitalist empires under its umbrella, uh, and displaced the centrality of the Americas to the American empire in terms of its importance. Um, the development of the euro dollar market was going on at the same time. Uh, with uh, the great British merchant bankers switching their allegiance uh, from sterling to the dollar, uh, and American banks uh, becoming dominant in both the euro dollar and euro bond market by the mid 1960s, which they remain to this day. Uh, most important and and very little talked about outside of specialist circles in international political economy was that a coordination began amongst the permanent staff of the finance ministries and the central banks in what were then known as the G10 countries as they attempted to cope with this crisis of the dollar within the Bretton Woods framework, meeting on a regular basis, establishing a high degree of camaraderie amongst each other, uh, and quite consciously as Volcker uh, would later explain in a remarkable set of memoirs he wrote with one of his Japanese counterparts, uh, we began to understand that insofar as the balance of social forces in a given country did not let a policy that we all thought was necessary through, right, that we would issue a statement and those forces inside that country would be able to say it was the G10 that made us do it. In each case, the Treasury and the Federal Reserve are at the center of, of this, and they're not alone, but this was very important. And, and that camaraderie uh, and co set of contacts continues to this day uh, uh, as uh, new elements have been socialized into it and new institutions have been structured under its framework uh, from the G7 to the G20 and much besides. Uh, now, this meant that when Bretton Woods fell apart, uh, far from this leading to the undoing of American empire, uh, far from this leading to the end of the central role of the dollar, uh, there was uh, a process right through the crisis of the 70s uh, whereby uh, the uh, centrality of the dollar became less, uh, rather greater rather than less in the era of fixed exchange rates. Uh, that was something coordinated. It was something that had a great deal to do with uh, one of the things that has sustained the American empire from that, that time on, which was, one has to say, the depth and inventiveness of financial markets in this country, not least in this city, although we usually say Wall Street when we mean that. Because, you know, once you've got floating exchange rates in a world of increasing economic integration, uh, you need some means of hedging the constantly shifting uh, relationship, exchange rates between currencies. If you're contracting to supply a multinational corporation with X next October, and you sign that contract without a hedge on what the currency will be, uh, six months from now, uh, it's not unlikely that you will not make a profit on that deal and might likely even go bankrupt with that deal. Well, the, what we now know is derivatives markets developed uh, immediately in the years uh, after Bretton Woods, and they developed on the basis of the expertise in futures markets right in this city, uh, as the Chicago Mercantile Exchange in particular turned its expertise in hog futures and wheat futures. Uh, with the help of Milton Friedman, I might point out, although it was a guy called Leo Malabant uh, who really you know, did the heavy lifting. And the state came in as it always does, since obviously we aren't operating, talking about a state that operates against markets, but a state that facilitates markets. That's what capitalist states do. Uh, the state came in, especially through the creation of the CFTC, 
which is now seen as a uh, thorn in the side of Wall Street, was explicitly created to facilitate the development of derivatives market. Um, what's very interesting and important about this, though, and why I'm putting, spending so much time on it, is that what you see in this period is the extent to which the American state takes responsibility for managing the contradictions and crises of global capitalism more than any other. Uh, if you look at uh, the role of the uh, German Central Bank today in this crisis, you see the enormous difference between the extent to which the Fed uh, takes responsibility the ability for managing the crisis of global capitalism, and uh, the Germans are much more narrow-minded. This partly has to do with ideology. It used to be said that when the rest of the world was reading Keynes in the late 1940s, the Germans were reading Hayek. Uh, uh, but it is a, a very, very orthodox banker's mentality uh, that has governed uh, uh, Germany uh, right in the post-war period. And, you know, from the f first bank instability after the collapse of Bretton Woods, uh, when there were a series of bank failures in the United States, in, in uh, the city of London, and the Herstadt Bank collapsed in 1974 in Germany, it was the Federal Reserve and the Treasury that had to drag the Germans kicking and screaming into not letting the international payment system collapse because when Her Herstadt would have collapsed, a series of American banks engaged in currency markets would have collapsed. They eventually were dragged and screaming and they b dragged it to do it and they were screaming the whole way. And out of that grew what famously is now known as the Basel system of uh, uh, capital adequacy uh, programs under the Bank for International Settlements. It took 15 years to develop, etc. cetera. Um, now, all of this uh, uh, is indicative of the continuing central role of the dollar, but it meant, uh, and, and of the American state with it, but it meant that there was all the more great pressure from uh, the rest of the world states involved in this uh, that the American dollar be stabilized in a system of currency exchange rates. And, the big problem with the American dollar in that period was everyone recognized was not simply deficits, uh, current and capital account deficits, but was the pressure coming from, under conditions of full employment, from an economically militant working class that was producing inflationary tendencies inside the United States. It was also true in other advanced capitalist countries, of course. But until the Americans could resolve their inflation problem, the dollar was going to be seen as subject to inflationary tendencies. And the book goes into some great detail about how the United States stumbled through the crisis of the 1970s, various attempts to deal with this, various attempts to step back from dealing with it until the famous Volcker shock, which began under Carter, because continued under Reagan, which <laughs> broke the backs of American trade unionism. Um, now, that defeat of American labor, which uh, we can talk about in greater detail, um, was uh, one of the reasons why a great many intellectuals on the left, especially social democratic political scientists, responded to uh, the turn to neoliberalism in the United States by arguing that, well, after all, there are varieties of capitalism. And we know that the Europeans have uh, a welfare state that, come, that came out of uh, having had a stronger labor movement uh, in the post-war period, or sometimes earlier, uh, that, that sedimented itself uh, institutionally, uh, so that you had a coordinated capitalism in Europe and a liberal market economy in the Anglo-American world, uh, that coordinated capitalism uh, was something that proves that you can have both efficiency and social justice in capitalism. The neoliberals are wrong, the monetarists are wrong, uh, and, and this was the dominant discourse of comparative uh, political science and comparative political sociology, uh, and indeed a good deal of political economy, including international political economy, uh, for the rest of the century. Uh, it, it, you know, it's the Robert Reich view of the world to some extent. Uh, uh, that's not to say it isn't about promoting capitalism. They, in fact, Robert Reich says very clearly it is, uh, and so do the Europeans. But we promote it better 
by virtue of having corporatist relationships with the unions, by having a welfare state which guarantees a certain floor for incomes, uh, etc. Now, this went so far as to call the states of Europe a strong state and the American state a weak state. And it was a weak state, presumably, because the argument was that the European states coordinate capitalism, and the American state lets market rip. Uh, the misunderstanding in, in this respect had to do with treating uh, these states as watertight compartments, entire, entirely missing the extent to which you already had an integrated capitalism by the 1980s. Not to speak of what I started talking about with the G10, although I could have given many other examples, the extent you had integrated state apparatuses by the mid-1980s, even leaving aside the security apparatuses and NATO, the military linkages, etc., at the economic level. In the economic agencies, you had integrated apparatuses through these states. Uh, and, and this failure to appreciate the integration of global <coughs> capitalism politically and economically uh, uh, was uh, astonishing uh, from uh, political scientists and political sociologists of the caliber we're talking about. And was ideologically driven. I mean, if Reagan says government's not the solution, it's the problem. Uh, if uh, neoclassical economists say uh, that uh, states operate against markets and therefore undermine market efficiency, then we on the left have to take the other side Right? and prove that markets need states. Right? And those states that are coordinating markets are right, ones that. Well, uh, uh, astonishingly, uh, this was being sold and taught to generations of political science students just at the time that European states, the coordinated market economies, were embracing neoliberalism partly because of the thrust to a unified Europe, the central principle of which had to be uh, integrated capital markets. Uh, the leading multinational corporations in Europe, uh, uh, almost to today, but certainly through the 80s, were American corporations. They were the ones that had integrated production from Spain to Germany, more than European multinationals did. Uh, uh, and above all, what was being missed was the extent to which, uh, as Europe moved towards integrated capital markets, it was Goldman Sachs and Morgan and the, uh, the expertise of the European investment banks that was being used to facilitate that capital integration. So Goldman Sachs starts setting up offices in Paris and Frankfurt, etc., and they say, we're setting them up in, just like McDonald's sets them up. We're, we, are, we are a global brand. And uh, they underwrite the privatization of Total in France, the largest privatization as of time. And then they're called in by uh, the German parliament to give them instructions on how to underwrite Deutsche Telekom's privatization, uh, which they then share with Deutsche Bank. Uh, they undershare that underwriting. And Deutsche Bank, yes, having previously represented the pinnacle of what was known as German banking integration with industry, whereby German banks own chunks of industry and particular banks flow <coughs> capital to industry, Deutsche Bank turns itself into an American investment bank, right? following that model explicitly, and indeed saying we have to do it because we'd be engaged in a conflict of interest if we were engaged in underwriting IPOs when we're so heavily directly invested in industry ourselves. Deutsche Bank ends up owning the biggest blocks of the foreclosed homes in Cleveland after the 2007 crisis. They end up holding, I don't know why it happened to be those, second, those mortgage securities they were holding, but that's the bank that does. Uh, I'm going to turn to Sam uh, because the question still, and Sam's going to take up this question, still does arise as to whether the United States in the 80s and 90s, given the effects of global integration on this economy, retains until this crisis and through it the material capacity to play the imperial role that it obviously had in the post-war period. 
Does it sustain that material capacity as you get a decline in the number of workers in manufacturing industry, uh, as you get uh, uh, a growth of American trade deficits, uh, as you get this shift to service uh, uh, production, uh, et cetera? And Sam's going to address that, and then uh, I'll come back uh, with some political discussion at the end about the current crisis. Okay. Thanks, Leo. <coughs> um, so as Adolf said, this question of decline is absolutely fundamental to any politics. It's really uh, asking ourselves soberly, uh, how do we assess what we're facing, and what does that imply for how we have to organize? So the first thing is that crisis and decline uh, aren't the same thing. The, the, the question of crisis, crises happen under capitalism, and the question coming out of the crisis of the 70s uh, is an empirical one. Did the American state have the capacity and the material base uh, to continue to reproduce itself uh, as the leader in the making of global capitalism? Uh, and that, that's, you know, that's a crucial question. And it's also part of the question of uh, if the U.S. was in decline, was that the cause of the present crisis, the 2007 crisis? So I'm going to address both of those questions. And, and the questions very much re revolve around, as Leo was saying, coming out of the 70s, the notion of decline was American productivity is down, profits are down, uh, there's trade deficits, which start at the end of the 70s and actually run almost consistently uh, to the present. The U.S. has trade deficits uh, throughout that period. There's the loss of manufacturing jobs. And of course, at that moment in time, a critical question was inflation, and the dollar was under attack. So the question is, what happens? And what Leo and I are arguing, which is, I think, quite provocative, is that rather than understanding the post-war period as consisting of a golden age and then an age of stagnation, we actually think that the period identified as neoliberalism is a golden age for capital. Uh, and to, to grasp that, you first of all have to get you have to look at it in a class way. That doesn't mean it was a golden age for workers at all. In fact, it's quite the opposite. The two are linked. The working class had to be defeated in order to get this uh, golden age of capital. So, so I just want to run through some of the arguments on this question because it is so important. Uh, the first thing that happens when you look at the 80s and 90s into 2000, into uh, moving into this crisis, in other words, if you're looking at roughly a quarter of a century, approximately the same uh, duration of time as the previous uh, golden age, is that profits did recover. Inflation was beaten. The bogey of inflation was uh, beaten, not just temporarily. It wasn't just a question of Volcker shock breaks the back of inflation, then it returns. It was beaten in a fairly permanent way. Inflation became a permanent parameter in the economy. Inequality grew incredibly. I mean, to an extent that it would, be, it would have been hard to predict at the time that this would be tolerated. And one of the reasons that's so important is actually when you analyze profitability figures, you actually have to include some of the compensation that went to managers, corporate executives, because a lot of that, those profits ended up to actually be paid in the form of, quote, wages. Salaries. Salaries. Uh, they're actually listed as wages in the statistics. <laughs> um, the second thing is that this is a period, I mean, this amazing thing, amazing things happen in this period. This is a period in which a thir the, that third of the globe that was standing outside of capitalism gets integrated. Soviet Union, Eastern Bloc, and China. This is an amazing development. And this is a period in which uh, the third world, which used to have liberation movements, nationalist movements that were, that were debating the question of staying within capitalism in the 60s and well into the 70s. That just doesn't exist anymore. These are amazing developments that are signals of the strength of capital. So when you look at this in an imperial way, when you, when you say, for example, that, well, the U.S. is obviously in decline. It had 50% of global production in 1950. Now it has 25%. That proves it's in decline. When you look at it in terms of the empire, in terms of the making of global capitalism, that's rather a success. The American state was successful in the spreading of capitalism, which obviously meant that you're not going to have all of it, but you have a piece of a much larger world. That was the critical thing. The other argument is that, well, this was a period of hollowing out. 
and people point to jobs, manufacturing, the deficit. Yes, it was hollowing out for working people. But for capital, it wasn't a period of hollowing out. It was a period of restructuring. It's an, it is, again, it's, a, it's an amazingly radical period of restructuring at almost any level you can think of. Workplaces were restructured in terms of power on the, uh, on the shop floor. New technologies came into place. Uh, the organization of production was changed in terms of outsourcing. Um, you have regional changes. Detroit, you know, people, Detroit is a disaster area, but you've got investment simultaneously taking place in rural areas in Michigan, and especially in the Sun Belt and in the American South. Uh, some industries do disappear virtually, like textiles, but industries like auto go through uh, a, a restructuring that includes Japanese and Kore Korean and German investment coming into the United States, choosing to come into the United States, uh, and not just for assembly, but for parts, and now they're coming in actually to do research here and design. Uh, the U.S. Uh, companies especially, where this is critical, is that the strategic sectors, the high-tech strategic sectors are ones that they dominate. Far, and I'll just give you some examples. Uh, and this extends from pharma care, aerospace, scientific instruments, uh, computers, uh, telecommunications equipment. But of the four largest technical, um, sorry, te uh, technology, hardware and equipment, uh, software and computers, um, aerospace uh, and oil equipment and services, of the top four globally, three are American. Of the 16 largest healthcare companies, in terms of both uh, equipment and uh, services, and that's one of the fastest growing sectors right now globally, out of the top 16, 14 are American. Not surprising given how much America spends on healthcare. Of the top five media companies, four are American. Of the top three, pharma care, industrial transportation, industrial equipment, and fixed line telecommunications, which I'm not that sure what it means. Two out of those top three are American. And in re general retail, five of the top six are American. So in those strategic sectors, uh, the American companies are absolutely fundamental. But probably the most significant place where American uh, capital dominates, again, thinking of it as an empire and the kind of things that an, America, an empire administratively does is in business services. When you look at business services, when you're looking at accounting, engineering, engineering very important, uh, legal, and consulting, American firms completely dominate. Anybody who wants to emulate the United States or outcompete it goes to American firms. So they're absolutely uh, crucial. And then, of course, there's the financial sector. Uh, and the importance of the financial sector, as Leo was emphasizing, is we have to get beyond this notion of the success of American finance is a measure of the failure of American capital. That this is this is a shift to speculative capital at the expense of industry. We have to appreciate the point that Leo was emphasizing. If you want a global capitalism, you have to have the kind of financial markets that we have that can, that can deal with risks of exchange rates and other risks. You don't have Bretton Woods anymore. You don't have a fixed exchange rate. You don't have a planned economy and you don't have fixed exchange rates. How are you gonna deal with these flows except through financial markets that are remarkably deep? Um, and, f and finance is so important not just to industry in terms of that. It's important to industry in terms of mergers and the restructuring they're going through. It's also important to workers, working class families, pensions, uh, mortgages, and credit. It's important to, to America as an empire. Its ability to attract global savings is absolutely crucial to its managing of the empire. It means it can be the consumer of last resort. It means that uh, it can legitimate itself by allowing workers to uh, borrow on credit, have homes uh, at very low interest rates. So finance is absolutely fundamental to this. Um, crucial to all of this was what I started with, which is the defeat of the working class. And we have to appreciate the extent of that defeat and how profound it is. When I started working for the auto workers, uh, in the late 70s, I remember one plant, Bud Automotive, had 78 wildcats. <laughs> we haven't had 78 wildcats in the past decade in all of the plants in Canada. And uh, workers have lost the, the confidence, but also the skills on how to do this, whereas corporations have actually spent 25 years figuring out how do you control this, 
So you get rid of anybody who actually sticks their neck out and learns that you just don't do this. So there's been a lowering of working class expectations through this period, a loss of the skills of struggle. Uh, in a sense, the working class has almost come to be part of reproducing neoliberalism because its mode of survival, when there isn't a left through which it can act, is to survive individually. So you work longer hours and you exploit yourself more. You stay at home longer and you show how flexible you are in terms of your standards. You hope that the stock market goes up because that'll raise your pension. Uh, and of course, you depended on homes started being homes. They become an asset. It's the one asset you have. It's your investment. It's something that you can borrow on uh, and invest in. So in all those ways, workers uh, start surviving individually, including, by the way, asking for tax breaks if they're not getting wage increases. They, they find ways to survive individually, and that does mean that the collective skills do begin to atrophy. You, you've got examples of explosions, rebellions here and there, but they're all localized, sporadic, and they don't add up to much. Okay, so uh, when we're looking uh, at this crisis, uh, the key point about understanding the present crisis is that it isn't the result of what people were expecting when they were looking at it in terms of decline. In other words, the people who are looking at it this decline were, were predicting that there would be a crisis, but they said the crisis would be because of imbalance, because of how much the U.S. trade deficit is so high, and because of the dollar. Uh, and in fact, neither of those things were the result of this crisis. So for example, when you look at the imbalances, uh, when you break down the U.S. trade deficit, what you actually find is that exports uh, were actually growing quite rapidly. They were growing faster, generally, than most of the developed countries. Uh, that wasn't the problem. The issue was that the U.S. was able to import more, partly because of population, partly because of uh, credit. But they were able to import more where nobody else would be able to import as much without the constraint of, well, you can't import more than you're exporting. The U.S. could do that, which was essentially, again, it was the strength of getting access to global labor that America could get. Uh, you also can't look at this just in terms of national statistics. American multinationals don't show up in the trade statistics, but they actually produce four times as much abroad as is exported from the United States. Uh, so that's critical. And when you're looking at manufacturing, what's often missed is that manufacturing itself hasn't hollowed, been hollowed out. Manufacturing is growing faster than GDP. Manufacturing productivity is growing faster than it did in the golden age. Jobs are declining because of that productivity in relatively saturated markets. So the problem wasn't those kinds of imbalances. That wasn't the problem. It wasn't profits. American profits uh, were high going into this crisis. And they actually were remarkably high given the depth of the crisis. And they're sitting on a couple of trillion dollars of cash. And it wasn't the dollar. Uh, uh, people weren't bringing the dollar into the United States to do the United States a favor, but because they were structurally dependent on it. If you have these funds, what are you going to do with them? Uh, this is where the deepest financial markets are. This is where it's safe to invest. If you put this into the euro, the first thing that would happen would be that the euro would put it into American dollars because it wouldn't want to hang on to them. So that was critical. Okay, so that wasn't the result of the crisis. Now, I just want to flag one other dimension of the decline debate, and then I'm going to turn it over to Leo, and that's the question of China, unless you want to do it a little bit. Uh, you know, one, one argument, okay, that's all very nice, but China's going to replace the United States as a leader. And uh, just a few very quick points on it. Uh, first of all, China's biggest headache right now is internal stability. And the way it deals with internal stability <coughs> is through growth. And the growth model that it has is growth that depends on the global economy, which is dominated and depends on American leadership. It is the most integrated late developer by far that has ever existed. Yeah, it's just remarkable at this stage of development how integrated it is in terms of its dependence on markets, its dependence on technology, and MNC, uh, foreign MNCs, even doing a lot of the exporting. So China is locked into a particular model. China because of its status in the world, is going to look to renegotiate its relationship with the global economy. So there's going to be some tensions, of course. But it isn't looking to provide that kind of leadership at all. I mean, you know, the notion, as Leo uh, said earlier, I don't remember if he said earlier or if you remember earlier, uh, 
you know, the notion of China taking over the management of the global economy, they, they haven't got the capacity to do it, and they're not the interest to do it, and they don't want the burden of doing it. So China can't do that. And when people make projections about where China's going to be, we don't know where China's going to be. But one thing we can't do is just draw a straight line projection to say they've been growing at 10%, so they'll grow at 10% forever. Uh, you have to bring the question of the balance of class forces into this question. Uh, while they're growing this fast, there is a whole part of the Communist Party that is becoming a bourgeoisie, that is being integrated into global capital, and it's, and it's that section of, of, the, uh, of the Chinese bourgeoisie that's so focused on exports doesn't want to move from exports into just dealing with the, the Chinese market internally, because that would be different capitalists. That would be inland and different capitalists. Um, and if China is going to play anything like an American role, it would have to liberalize finance. You would have to have the kind of financial markets that people actually think it's going to depend on what the market does, not what the Communist Party arbitrarily decides one day. And the Chinese Communist Party can't do that, because so, the, the, you know, the foundation of their strength right now is it's the one thing that they control, other than the army, that is this ability to allocate capital regionally and sectorally as part of some kind of development strategy, and, and to give it up the grace, you know, questions about its ability to reproduce itself. So, when we get to this crisis, we have to look at this crisis differently than the kind of arguments that are floating around in terms of decline. Those don't make sense. What does make sense when you look at this crisis is you have to understand it in terms of the role of finance and the contradictions within finance, and you have to understand it in terms of the defeat of labor. In other words, two of the things that emerged from the previous crisis, the liberalization of finance and its strength, and the defeat of labor, have their own contradictions, and now they're affecting this crisis. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, for better or worse, uh, Sam and I have sometimes identified ourselves, and very often identified as Marxists. Um, we're running against the grain of a lot of Marxist analysis in this book. Uh, we're not operating with a labor theory of value. Uh, we're arguing that uh, although there's a tendency of capital to expand, it constantly runs into barriers, uh, and those barriers need uh, state action, which is historically very conditional uh, uh, to uh, remove those barriers to capital's expansion. Um, we, in that sense, are criticizing Marx for having, as E.P. Thompson once said, uh, fallen into the trap of classical political economy and its search for eternal uh, laws and dynamics of markets, uh, and are stressing historical contingency, uh, etc. Uh, one thing, though, that is very Marxist about our analysis is that. Uh, as Hobbes once said, uh, Marxism is a structural functionalism. It identifies one element, in turn explains an element in any system in terms of its function, these are the other elements of the totality. Marxism differs as any other structural functionalism because it argues and shows, demonstrates, that in the performance of a given function, that element also creates dysfunction. And that's what contradiction is. And uh, we think that you need to have that type of methodological principle <coughs> when you're trying to understand the current crisis in particular. So finance is enormously functional to integrated global production. It's absolutely central to the reproduction of the role of the American empire as a manager of global capital uh, in terms of the depth of American uh, financial market. As Sam says, the notion that China or, or Japan or Germany are doing the United States a favor by flowing their surplus in trade to the United States is entirely mistaken. They're, they're bailing out the American trade deficit because that, without that, the Americans wouldn't be able to guarantee oil from the Middle East to them at a certain price. No, uh, not at all. Uh, they, are, uh, they were flowing here in order to maintain their exchange rates, which maintains their export capacity. They were flowing here above all because of the depth of financial markets and the instruments they produce. But they were flowing here most of all 
because the American state is seen by the world's bourgeoisie as the ultimate protector of property. And when you have instability, where does capital flow? It flows to the state in which you have most confidence in terms of protecting the property. And that's what has repeatedly happened. Now, that is very important to understand in terms of the dysfunction of finance, including the dysfunction of America's deep financial markets. There were 72 financial crises in the 1990s, 72 in low and middle income countries. That's not even to speak of the famous 1967 stock market crash. As soon as Greenspan became 87, uh, 87 stock market crash. As soon as Greenspan became uh, governor, it's not even to speak of uh, the 1994 <laughs> crisis on Wall Street when the Mexico peso crisis happened. It's not to speak of the long-term capital management crisis, not to speak of the dot-com crisis in 2000. So as finance has exploded and extended and deepened, it's also become more vulnerable to crises because of the nature of financial volatility. Uh, and, and what's very important in this respect is that the American state has increasingly defined its role in this respect. The Treasury submitted a report to Congress in 1998 on this theme. Uh, uh, it has seen its role as that of failure prevention. It explicitly said, we can't be in the business of failure prevention. Because if you're in the business of failure prevention, you're introducing the kinds of regulations which undermine the ability to finance, to develop the innovations that allow integrated global markets to function. But there are inevitable crises. And what you need to understand about Greenspan and Rubin and Summers, the whole panoply of them, they may be members, certainly Greenspan may have been a stalwart member of the Ayn Rand Society, but he's a pragmatist. And he constantly says, he doesn't believe, as neoclassical economists in this university do, that markets inevitably tend to equilibrium. He also knows they tend to disequilibrium. In his testimony to Congress, the time of removal of glass people, they said, well, why does Federal Reserve want to keep its regulatory powers? He said, so we can know when the next crisis happens, what we need to do by knowing how serious it is in different banks. And what they need to do, of course, is to throw liquidity into the banking system to be lenders of last resort. And from that 67, from the 87 crisis on, that's what Greenspan has always done. Massive state intervention. Not only throwing liquidity in, but calling the principles of the Wall Street banks together and saying, you need to bail each other out. And really instructing them to do so in the instance of every crisis. This is what J.P. Morgan used to do before you had the Federal Reserve. Um, so, uh, finance is functional and it's simultaneously dysfunctional. And the crisis that led to 2007, as Sam says, was not a crisis of imbalances. There was no run on the dollar because of the growing deficit, as everybody predicted. It was not a crisis of profitability. Brenner is wrong, says right? There was a recovery of profits from 83 on. Uh, and, and the corporations were, uh, I think at one point in 2006, their, their share of profits was higher than it had been at any point in the post-war period. Now, that doesn't speak to its rate, but it gives you an indication of how well they were doing in terms of profits. Uh, the, the roots of the crisis lie in the volatility of finance. But what made this crisis so significant as it compared to the previous one, why it was so difficult to contain was that this crisis needs to be understood in terms of the defeat of the working class that we were speaking of and the integration of workers into finance. We were speaking of. Because when you have a housing bubble that comes apart, it's different than when a stock market bubble comes apart. It has an immediate effect on the construction industry. It has an immediate effect on working class consumption, yes, in relation to housing, furniture, white goods, appliances, etc. But it has an immediate effect on their consumption in general, right? Because this is their major asset. And insofar as wages have been stagnating for three decades, right, increasingly workers, and they did maintain their standard of living for the most part, right through the neoliberal era, right, 
but they maintained it through credit. And a lot, of course, what was going on with mortgages was finally trying to bring the black working class into the American dream through giving them access to what has been the core of the American dream. You can be a property owner too, right? But a lot of it had to do with workers in general taking out second mortgages in order to sustain their consumption. So when that housing bubble falls apart, uh, it has a, 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 the kind of effect uh, that other bubbles don't, right? The dot com didn't, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, one needs to say, uh, and one hesitates to say it because one wants Obama to get reelected uh, in, in the face of the limited choices one has in this country. If the rest of the world watches you guys elect president, the president of the world. Uh, one has to say that the attempt to integrate uh, American black communities uh, into the American dream through their integration of financial markets is something that goes back to what was one of the major reforms of the Carter era, the Community Reinvestment Act. It was one of the great victories of the left of the Democratic Party, including the Black Caucus. One of the few victories of the Carter period. And it forced banks, who previously had redlined black communities, to lend 5% of their capital into those communities. And immediately, was opposed by every banker in America, except for one Chicago banker who spoke in favor of the Congress. And immediately, what Bank of America had already been doing uh, in the run-up to that, you got this explosion of a mortgage, a mortgage security market. The banks said, OK, if we're going to be forced to do this, we want to be able to sell off those mortgages. And the process began of bundling mortgages of different types of uh, liquidity in the market, right? And selling them off in secondary security markets. Now, it wasn't very large in the 1980s. One of the reasons Clinton was known as the black president was because his administration really pumped this up. And in that report I referred to, where the Treasury defined its role as that of failure containment, there's this remarkable passage where they take enormous credit for the creation of the secondary market in mortgages, the mortgage security market, say that the world is rushing to buy mortgage securities for Americans, and especially say we are finally taking that Achilles heel of the American dream, how to get the American black into the American dream, and we are fulfilling. This is 1998, the Treasury under Rubin and Summers. Well, then Bush comes along and lets, lets every shyster into the business, of course. That's what the Republican Party is. It's at the local level a party of real estate agents. <laughs> well, in Florida, as the congressional inquiry showed, and I'm astonished that this hasn't been pumped up, and I keep waiting for Obama to say it in one of the debates, there were 10,000 people. There were 10,000 people selling mortgage securities, selling mortgages in Florida during the Bush administration who had criminal records. 4,000 of them had convictions for fraud. Right. Uh, so yes, he lets every shyster into the business, but the basis for it's already there. And the world piles into it all the more because after the dot-com bubble, when you get this jobless recovery, and you do get a recovery very quickly, it's a very you know, a short period of recession, the world com comes piling into these mortgage securities because they're backed by the, no, the American state, Right, through these semi-agencies that Fannie Mae and Freddie uh, Mac are, but also because interest rates are low. The Fed keeps interest rates low in order to keep that recovery from the recession going. So why buy a Treasury bill if it's going to be backed by the American state? Buy one of these mortgage securities, which give you a higher return, and you get the German Landesbank, presumably the core of this coordinated market economy, being pressured by the EU to get into doing this, right? Because of the change in banking rules in the EU, the Landis Bank and ought to be giving a higher rate of return. And it's Norwegian municipalities and the German Landis Bank are the first ones to get in when the bubble bursts. Now, when it bursts, what's most interesting, and nobody talks about this, of course, Democrats don't want to admit it above all, but it was Bush, the Bush administration that was doing it. The first people who come to the Fed's window are Paribas from France, the Bank of China, 
It's the New York branches of foreign banks that are bailed out by the Fed. Now, this is embarrassing. You don't tell American voters that the Fed's money is bailing out foreign banks. That isn't part of the American political discourse. And there is, in that sense, a real tension between the American state as a global state and you know, the, the empire in the absence of an international state acting for global capital and the state of its own social formation in which it's not popular to be lending money to foreign banks. You don't hear about the, just as you don't hear much talk about the drones, right? And this illegal murder of, what, 3,000 people now, self-admittedly, 3,000 people have been murdered by these drones. That doesn't come up in the debate. So does the Fed's lending to the foreign branches uh, of, of banks in New York not come up in the debate. And it, it's consistent right through this crisis. When the Fed engages in quantitative easing, including the most recent round, one of the main reasons it's doing it is not that it uh, does it only to try to keep the American economy going in a context of a fiscal stalemate. It does it in order to ensure that money will flow from more dollars, will flow from Wall Street to European banks, who are in much greater difficulty than American banks are. And if those dollars were lent overnight to Europe, the financial crisis in Europe would be very dangerous for Wall Street itself. And it's been Geithner and Barnaby, who have been putting enormous pressure on the European Central Bank, quite openly, right, to play a much more active role of the kind the Fed has been playing as the world central bank in this crisis. So what are the characteristics of this crisis? As we said, it's a very severe crisis, but it's not a crisis of American agenda. State intervention, nothing new. The same type of intervention that went on in 87, in 1994 and 97, but on a much greater scale. Uh, it doesn't mean we see the end of neoliberalism. On the contrary, this was part of neoliberalism, despite the ideological cover that gets us confused about states, markets escaping states. Secondly, a remarkable degree of coordination amongst the leading capital states of the world. Unlike the crisis of the 30s, somewhat like the crisis of the 70s, but much more openly and clearly, and now extending from the G7 to the G20, You've seen coordination by the, those states. Coordination in what sense? They explicitly said when Bush brought them together, first time the leaders of the G20 were brought together, was created after the Asian crisis to bring together central bankers and finance ministers. Bush in, in October, just after TARP, brought the leaders of the G20 together and they committed themselves not to allow themselves to go back to the breaking up of globalization as happened in the we will not introduce tariffs, we will keep free capital movements going, et cetera. And then, when they met in Toronto and you had that appalling police riot against the demonstrators in, in, in uh, Toronto in June 2010, their communique said, we pledged ourselves to do this in 2008, we did it, we're proud of it, it was the right thing to do, and we commit ourselves to that continuing. They also, in 2009, coordinated a stimulus. And without that stimulus, it was led by the United States with its largest stimulus in peace by uh, The Chinese did their bid as well, heaven knows. And without that stimulus, you would have had a much, much more severe, probably disruption of world trade, if that had not happened. Uh, but the irrationality of capitalism in the 21st century is also painfully obvious in this context. What did Obama's stimulus do, it mainly compensated for cutting back public, sorry, public employees' wages and even the layoff of public employees at the state and municipal level as the federal surplus was taken, if the federal set of stimulus was going on. It mainly was making what was going on in the states not quite as bad as it would have been. Uh, that, and that isn't a matter of Republican ideology. It's a matter of can you sustain you're borrowing in the municipal bond market. Uh, now, we've returned to a situation in which finance has been bailed out, saved, and we all depend on it. The working classes depend on it, as I was saying. Of course it had to be saved. But now that it's saved, the logic of bankers' orthodoxy everywhere reasserts itself. The fear of inflation, the fear that the bond markets won't be repaid, the fear of default, etc. 
Money keeps pouring into the United States because it's the state least likely to default at the national level. It is seen as the safe haven. Uh, uh, the dollar is not endangered at all in this crisis. Uh, and, and states coordinate that. When last summer, the summer before last now, you saw the antics in Washington over not allowing the Treasury to increase its borrow. Right? It was the Chinese who said, America is being irresponsible. You have a special responsibility to keep this global economy going. It was the Chinese who said it. So what's very significant about this crisis is we do not see conflict between states. We do not see something that would sustain a return to a theory of interferial rivalry as being the theory of imperialism. You don't also see a conflict between financial capital and industrial capital. A lot of interpretations of the 1930s of the New Deal were rested on that alleged conflict between fractions of capital. You do not see this in this crisis. Very interesting. Practically nowhere, despite the responsibility of finance pay bears for the cause of this crisis. What you do see is an increased conflict within states. Not so much a conflict between states as conflict between states. And there's two big questions uh, in this conflict. One, can the G20 states be integrated the way the G7 states are integrated? So that this coordination can continue. It's an enormous challenge to the American Empire. Uh, obviously, it's much more difficult to integrate the UK, China, Brazil, Russia, South Africa in the way in which the European states were for reasons of history, culture, language, a uh, piece of cake with Canada, but uh, more difficult with Europe and Japan, much more difficult with the other states of the G20. Uh, and they lie outside, to some extent, of the linkages of NATO, the linkages of security apparatuses, which are a backstop for all of this. So that's significant. And who knows the answer? To that? That's the greatest challenge. Pro the other and more significant challenge, however, is what shape will the internal conflict that this crisis gives rise to? What shape will it take? We see enormous class struggles in China, many of them very violent class struggles. Right? It's one strike wave after another happens. Uh, will that lead to an independent trade union movement? If it leads to an independent trade union movement, will the goal of that movement be individual consumerism? as the fate of the Western working class uh, turned out to be in terms of its successful trade unions? Or will it be some attempt to secure collective needs again uh, in a way that is not met by individual consumers, which would interrupt the integration of capitalism? Uh, it's very likely that we'll see more Greece with the type of internal conflict that is marking Greece now, some of it coming from the record as a fascist movement, more of it coming from a remarkable new socialist party, uh, uh, which has its roots in Euro-communism in the 1980s, in the attempt to fashion something beyond Leninism and beyond social democracy. Uh, uh, but you know, it's easy to say, and I have called for it, Greece should have defaulted on its debt three years ago. And Syriza uh, does not want to default on the debt. They are absolutely committed to staying in Europe, etc. Uh, but they're also committed to not seeing through the Troika's austerity program. If they are forced out, one should have no illusions about this letting the Greeks off the road. We're back to 1917, the weakest link, the suffering that the Greeks will face in terms of their ability to buy basic foodstuffs, oil, Secondary products that are necessary to what production goes on in Greece and the intermediary product uh, is enormous. So unless there would be a shift in the balance of forces in Europe, above all in Germany, it does sound like 1917 in that respect. Uh, uh, what this would mean for Greece is incalculable, right? unless they were let off the hook in terms of the price they'd have to pay for a complete break with the euro. And this applies to this country too. We saw, you know, I saw a handheld sign at Zuccotti Park last October. Young woman 
had written on the sign, uh, the trouble with the American dream is that you have to be asleep to believe it. <laughs> Wake up. <laughs> and Occupy captured uh, the possibility of a very different political discourse in this country. But it is part of its zeitgeist on the part of more than young people, okay, a number of generations who are afraid of organization for good reasons, given uh, the failures of working class parties uh, and unions in the 20th century, the way in which organization of a certain kind eventually demobilized and worse. Uh, uh, and, and that means that the type of politics is generates, even when the discourse is of a class nature, 99 to 1, etc., right? uh, makes it very hard to build the type of organizational capacity that would once again develop the capacities of class struggle. So the world watches, as I said, while the US elects the president of the world. Uh, it watches, of course, when Occupy happens, and it imitates it. Uh, that's not to say Occupy wasn't imitating the rear square. That's the type of world we now live in. Uh, but it's very clear uh, that unless political organizations reemerge, and working class organizations are generally uh, which can make the case for not only massive public expenditure, which is the only way you'll get out of this crisis, uh, but also for taking banking and making it a public utility, which would begin the process of a socialization of the investment function. Uh, we're not going to easily emerge from this crisis. And, you know, that is the main point of the book, that, you know, the left once had a vision, and the proletariat once had a vision, of getting beyond capitalism. It, for better or worse, ended up with a vision of a different variety of capitalism. That different variety of capitalism is not offered. And until we rebuild a politics which is oriented then to speaking of capitalism versus something else, socialism, whether do communism, what have you, uh, we are stuck in the contradictions of this global neo neoliberalized capitalism, which operates under the aegis of the American state for the foreseeable future. Sorry to have so much.